Hey everybody, thanks for joining the Windows Server 2012 Early Experts Challenge. Today we're going to be kicking off the Installer Quest. And my name is Keith Mayer. I'm an IT Pro Technical Evangelist at Microsoft. The Windows Server 2012 Early Experts Challenge is a study group program that's organized into a series of online knowledge quests. Each of those knowledge quests targets a particular set of exam objectives for the certification exams that are associated with the MCSA certification on Windows Server 2012. Each knowledge quest, when you successfully complete it, ends with a certificate of achievement that's customized with your own name and it's suitable for printing and framing or sharing online with your own community of peers. We're going to be targeting specifically the certification exams that are part of the MCSA series on Windows Server 2012 with our goal, once we're all done, to give you knowledge around all of the exam objective domains so that you can be successful in passing the exams associated with that certification. Now, the exams that are associated with the MCSA track are different depending on whether you're new to Microsoft certification or whether you have an existing certification that can be upgraded to the MCSA on Windows Server 2012. For the Early Experts Challenge, we'll be targeting the new to Microsoft certification track as our primary set of exam objectives to target. So that means we'll be starting off with exam 410, the install and config exam, followed by 411, the administering exam, and then 412, configuring advanced Windows Server 2012 services. We'll be taking the 410 exam as our first exam that we'll be targeting between now and the end of November as part of our initial knowledge quests, and well, then we'll be continuing on with the other two exams as we proceed into the January time frame. Now, if you are planning on doing the upgrade path and targeting just exam 417, as we go through each of the knowledge quests for exams 410, 411, and 412, I'll be calling out the specific exam objectives that also apply to exam 417. This month we'll be going through the installer quest and the good news is that all of the installer quest applies to prepping for both exam 410 and exam 417. So all of the material we'll be going through is relevant for both exams. The installer quest, we're going to target these first two exam objectives out of the six total exam objective domains that are part of exam 410. So in the installer quest we'll be targeting installing and configuring Windows Server 2012 as well as installing and administering Active Directory. Now as you may recall the installer quest is the second knowledge quest in our early expert series. So last month you should have already completed the apprentice quest to get a strong technical overview of the end-to-end -end changes and enhancements present in Windows Server 2012 as well as stepping through the process of downloading the Windows Server 2012 installation bits and using them to set up your lab environment in a dual boot configuration using boot to VHD as the configuration choice. Now if you haven't finished the Apprentice Quest yet, that's okay. You still have the material available to you online. You can go to the link that I'm highlighting. That's aka.ms slash early experts apprentice. That'll take you to that material. You can finish that off and then come back here when you're ready to begin the Installer Quest. To get to the Installer Quest this month, you'll go to the aka.ms early experts installer link that I'm highlighting and that will step you through the study plan for each of the key objective areas and then next month in October we'll be going through the Explorer quest and then in November the last two knowledge quests that target networking and virtualization with Windows Server 2012 to finish out our prep for exam 410. The idea then is that between the end of November and the mid-January time frame when we resume on our next set of knowledge quests for exam 411 in between those times you'll be preparing for the exam you'll be scheduling your exam for exam 410 and you'll be hopefully passing your exam so that we get that out of the way 
before we come back in mid-January and tackle our next set of knowledge quests for exam 411. So let's take a look at some of the common questions that have come up. For those of you that have been going through the apprentice quest and setting up your study lab, there's been a few different questions that I've called from our LinkedIn community group, and I thought it would make sense to summarize here. One of the questions was, can the study lab be virtualized? If you already have your own virtual environment, can you just put Windows Server 2012 as a virtual machine in that environment? And you can certainly do that. Windows Server 2012 runs great as a virtual machine guest. However, when we get to the virtualizer quest in November, where we have to install the Hyper-V role on Windows Server 2012, that won't work if Windows Server 2012 itself is virtualized as a guest. And that's because the Hyper-V role needs to be installed on bare metal hardware so that it can communicate with the virtualization extensions that are running on that hardware and properly virtualize the processor, memory, and resources to expose to its own set of virtual machine guests. So you can virtualize the study lab. That'll work fine until you get to the virtualizer quest. That's where it won't work. If you don't have any hardware or lab environment to use for your study lab, that was another question. What can you do? Well, you can build your study lab in our Windows Azure cloud using the new Windows Azure virtual machine and virtual network support that's part of the infrastructure as a service offering on Windows Azure. We have a lab guide that you can go through to build Windows Server 2012 in the cloud in your own study lab, and that's listed right here where I'm highlighting. However, because Windows Azure is itself its own hypervisor, you'll have the same restrictions that we just talked about up above. So you'll be able to install Windows Server 2012 in Azure, use it as a study lab remotely, but when we get to that virtualizer quest, you will not be able to install the Hyper-V role in that configuration. So the preference is to have local hardware if you have it available and go through the study lab setup that's documented in the Apprentice Quest for configuring it. That way you'll be able to do all of the lab exercises end to end as you prepare for the exams. Now those of you that um, went through setting up Windows Server 2012 on your own study lab hardware in that boot to VHD configuration. You may have seen a couple issues that came up. Some of you raised those issues. One is when installing Windows Server 2012, it just hangs on a black screen during the installation when it tries to boot for the first time into Windows Server 2012 after the initial file copy process finishes. If you have that happen on your machine, usually that type of problem is the symptom of either hardware or device driver issues. So the first thing to check is if you're using any type of fancy video cards in your lab PC, drop into the BIOS or firmware settings when you're booting your machine up and check to see if your video settings are set to use integrated video or an add-in video card. If it's set to use an add-in video card, switch it back to integrated video, boot back up, Go back through the installation process, let it finish, and then when it gets all the way done with the installation process and you log in for the first time, install your additional video drivers. Then you can shut down, restart, go back in, and enable your add-in video board again if you'd like. The other option that you may see is with some hardware, there may be some device driver challenges, particularly if it's really old hardware. Windows Server 2012, to improve security of the server operating system, enforces device driver signing. That means that any hardware device driver needs to have a digital signature on it signed by the developer in order for it to load properly in Windows Server 2012. Well, when you're setting up a study lab environment on perhaps older hardware, you may run into this issue. If you suspect that it's a device driver issue, when you're booting up or trying to boot up Windows Server 2012, you can hit the F8 key, like you would in prior versions of Windows, to drop into your boot setting choices. And you'll find a new boot setting choice, a new boot up choice called Disable uh, Driver Signing. That allows you to disable your driver signing temporarily to get into Windows Server 2012, to get it booted up. 
and uh, get past that issue. So it's something to try if you're seeing that same, that same problem. Once you've installed Windows Server 2012 on your lab equipment, if you have a wireless network card in your lab PC, you may have noticed that it doesn't automatically connect to your Wi-Fi. And that's because Windows Server 2012 doesn't expect that you'll have a Wi-Fi or wireless network card in a server class machine which is true for the most part if you're operating servers in a data center. However, if you have a desktop or a laptop PC that you're using as your study lab and it has a wireless card, there's a quick and easy fix to getting that wireless card set up. And that's adding in the wireless LAN service feature using Server Manager with Windows Server 2012. And I'm just going to pop over into my lab server environment and show you where that is. So we're on Windows Server 2012 on my lab server. We're at the server console. This is the new Server Manager tool. And Server Manager, you'll notice, has been completely redesigned in Windows Server 2012 to give a much more visually informative uh, dashboard of information initially that transcends all of the various roles that are running on your network along with the health of those roles. You'll see my, all, all of my roles are green. They're all healthy right now, but if any of them were red, I could drill right into them. Server Manager also gives you the ability to manage not only your local server, but also other remote servers that you have on your network. You can right click on all servers and add additional servers in. You can also group them together up on the Manage menu. You can create additional server groups and add servers into those groups so that you can effectively use Server Manager as your management console in mid-sized networks for managing several servers as easily as you managed a single server in the past. So I really like the new updated Server Manager. It really gives a lot of additional functionality for managing small and mid-sized environments that have multiple servers, whether those servers are physical or virtual servers. But we were talking about adding wireless LAN service support on our Server 2012 box, and we said we needed to add a feature in order to do that. Well, that we can do up in Server Manager, up on the Manage menu. If we click on Manage, and then click on the Add Roles and Features option, that will launch the Roles and Features wizard. Well, we can click Next to advance to the next screen. We want to do a role or feature-based installation, so I'll leave my radio button set to its default option and click Next. And then I can select a server to install my new features on. Well, I could select my local server, which I'll do, or I could select one of the remote servers that are on my network. Because Server Manager allows me to remotely manage servers, part of that remote management is also adding features and removing features remotely. I can also use the alternate radio button choice up at the top here to select a virtual hard disk choice so that instead of adding or removing features on a server, I can instead specify the path to a virtual hard disk that's sitting in a shared folder on my network and add the features into that virtual hard disk. That virtual hard disk then could be used to spin up additional Windows Server virtual machines using the configuration that I've already built. So that's something we call offline servicing for adding roles and features because the virtual hard disk is not currently running anywhere on the network, it's offline. It allows us to add roles and features in an offline manner. So Back to adding the wireless LAN service feature that we came into this tool for. I'm going to drop back to selecting a server from my pool of servers that I'm managing. I'll select my local server. I'll click Next. And I'll get a list of roles that I can install. Well, roles are additional network services like Active Directory or DHCP or DNS that I can install on this server to have it host those network services on the network. In my case, I don't want to add any additional roles right now, although in the future lab exercises you'll be adding roles as you go through the remaining uh, the current and future knowledge quests. Instead, what I want to do is I want to click the Next button and get to my Features list because that Wireless LAN service feature that we were talking about earlier, that's 
one of our features on the features list. You'll notice that I have it installed, but it's not installed by default on Windows Server. So you'll see when you come into that option initially after installing your server, that's unchecked. You can go ahead and check that option and then click the install button to install that feature. Upon shutting down and restarting after installing that feature, your network, your wireless network card should work properly in being able to associate to your wireless access point. Now, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Server Manager when you're working through the various lab exercises, I'd encourage you on the Server Manager dashboard to click on the What's New tile because that has links to some really great articles that allow you to step through some of these new capabilities in Server Manager for adding and managing remote servers, creating custom server groups, getting the status across all of the servers that you've added in and all of the roles that are running on those servers, performing tasks on multiple servers at one time, and deploying roles and features remotely, which we just talked about briefly. So I'd encourage you to step through those four articles at some point during this next four weeks as you're going through your installer quest labs. So for now, I'm just going to switch back over to our slide deck so that we can talk a little bit more about the early experts installer quest. The installer quest is made up of four key areas that are targeted in the first two objective domains by exam 70-410, the installing and configuring Windows Server 2012 exam. And over the next four weeks, I've organized those four key areas on a recommended week-by-week -week study plan on the slide that I'm showing right now. So the first portion of this study plan, step one, actually is quite lengthy. It goes through the installation and configuration of Windows Server 2012 across a number of different um, across a number of different server installation modes. It covers the server with a GUI that your study lab is currently installed with. That's the server with the full graphical user interface. It also covers server core, which is the other end of the extreme, the, a server installed with no graphical user interface tools and is managed from the command line on the local console or managed remotely using the remote server administration tools. And then a middle option called the minimal server interface. Minimal server interface gives you support for running the most common graphical management tools at the server console, but it doesn't include the full Windows Explorer, Internet Explorer, and Windows 8 start screen style interface on the server console. So it still takes away some of the graphic, graphical shell support, while giving you the ability to run the common graphical management tools that you may need for managing your server through those tools from the console. So because step one is pretty lengthy, I'd recommend dividing that between re weeks one and weeks two, and then in weeks two also picking up on configuring NIC teaming, and week three going into configure local storage, and in week four install and administer Active Directory. Now, each of these steps are documented on the Early Expert Installer page that's listed at the top. So if you switch over to that page, you'll see the Installer Quest, you'll see the specific exam objectives that we're targeting out of Exam 70-410, and then you'll see those four steps with a button that links you to the study plan associated with that step. So if I go to install and configure servers, that'll bring me to a page that as I scroll down gives me initially a video to watch that provides an overview of deployment options that are new for server 2012 as well as an overview of server core and the minimal server interface. I also have a pretty extensive list of study materials, reference materials that I would recommend reading through after you watch the video because those will provide more depth on each of those topic areas. And then a hands-on lab. So we're taking the same approach with, with each of the study plan steps. Kind of a, a watch it to understand what it is, study it to get more depth, on that topic area and then do it. 
do the hands-on lab activities that are documented in, uh, in a particular hands-on lab guide. Now in this case, for this hands-on lab guide, we'll be going through the process of taking our full server GUI and bringing it down to the minimal server interface first, and then transitioning that minimal server interface to server core. At each step of the way, we'll be playing around with some of the tools that are available in both the minimal server interface as well as in server core so that you can gain good knowledge of, of using each of those. Now you may be thinking, well, why would I want to run my server without the full GUI installed? Well, the main reason is so that you're reducing the amount of resources required to run that server particularly if you're using server core it has just a uh, just it, it has no graphical user interface or graphical management tool so it reduces the size the footprint of the server operating system by about four gigabytes by uninstalling all that extra baggage associated with the graphical user interface it also makes it much more manageable because now you don't have to worry about managing patching and securing all of those graphical aspects of the server operating system more and more we're, we're focused on encouraging environments to run Windows Server 2012 in server core mode so that resources are reduced and the amount of time you spend managing the server for patches and security and whatnot can be reduced as well. That's why the exam targets so heavily on, on not only being able to manage the full server with a GUI, but also being able to work with server core. So you'll see on the exam, when you take it, that many of the areas may ask for how to do a particular task using GUI-based tools, and then how to complete that same task using command line tools, PowerShell, or other command line tools that are used for particular purposes. So as we go through each of these areas, you'll see the lab guides and the study materials are aligned to that. They're giving you exposure to how to do each task using the GUI management tools as well as using the command line tools. Now to give you a little bit of a, a sense of how this all works, if we drop back into our manage menu in server manager, uh, we just went through the add roles and features wizard. I'm going to go over to remove roles and features and show you how the server graphical interface, the, the GUI interface, is divided out as a set of features. So if we go back through here, select our server, next, get over to our features list. So we scroll down our features list, you'll see a feature collection titled user interfaces and infrastructure. And underneath that, you'll see two graphical choices, the graphical management tools and infrastructure and the server graphical shell. These two features together provide, if they're both installed, like they are right now, those two features install everything that's needed for the full server graphical user interface, all of the graphical management tools, the graphical shell, the full GUI experience. However, if we want to go down to that minimal server install where we don't have Windows Explorer, we don't have Internet Explorer, we don't have the Windows 8 style start screen, but we do have the ability to run many of our graphical administrative tools, all we need to do is uncheck the server graphical shell and remove that. As we remove that after rebooting, we'll see the Windows Explorer, Internet Explorer, the Windows 8 style start screen, they are all uninstalled. But we'll still be able to run tools from the command line. We'll be able to launch tools like Server Manager and Computer Management and, and uh, the Active Directory Management tools, other MMC-based tools, PowerShell-based tools, and whatnot. So that's the minimal server interface. And then to transition from the minimal server interface to server core, in the lab, you'll be using some PowerShell commands, the uninstall-windows feature PowerShell commandlet specifically, to also remove the graphical management tools and infrastructure. With both of those options removed, after the server restarts, that will bring you up in server core mode. So one of the important points here is that switching between server core, minimal server interface, and server with a GUI is no longer an install time decision. It's something that you can easily transition back and forth between by installing or uninstalling the appropriate features. And you'll see that during the lab.
Um, it's also important to note that as you step through the installation process and building out your study lab, the only options that you saw when you were installing the server operating system were to install the server with server core or to install the server with the full server GUI. There's no install time option to install the minimal server interface. That's something that has to be selected after install by either removing the server graphical shell feature if you're running server with a GUI or by adding the graphical management tools and infrastructure if you installed server core. So you'll be going through a lab to transition to minimal server interface, play around with that a little bit in the lab. You'll be going through another lab to transition to server core by uninstalling both of those features using PowerShell. Once you have a little bit of experience in the lab with server core and have a chance to work through some of the server core command line tools, then you'll be using the install-windows feature PowerShell commandlet to reinstall both of these features and bring yourself all the way full circle back to server with a GUI. So that's how server core and the minimal server interface and the server with GUI work. Um, now after you finish up install and configure servers, and remember that's a relatively lengthy study plan associated with that first step, the next step is configuring NIC teaming. And we have the same type of layout where you'll be going through a video that you'll be watching on NIC teaming to explain what NIC teaming is and how it works, some study materials on NIC teaming this, that correspond to this exam objective, and then a hands-on lab guide where you'll be configuring NIC teaming yourself. Now, in order to do NIC teaming, you have to have more than one network interface card, more than one Ethernet NIC in your physical study lab machine. Um, so that you don't have to run out though and buy more network cards and try to fit them into your study lab machine. What you'll be doing in the lab is installing a couple of loopback network adapters. Loopback adapters are basically software drivers that we've created to simulate a network adapter so that we can install these loopback adapters, simulate two or more network cards and then be able to use that to, to practice teaming them together. So in the lab, in order to install those loopback adapters, what you'll be doing is dropping into your server and in server manager, navigating to the tools menu, and then over under computer management, we'll launch that, you'll be going into device manager. and when you're in Device Manager, we're going to install a new network adapter. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Network Adapter. Up in my Action menu, I'm going to tell it to add legacy hardware. The loopback adapters are considered legacy hardware. I'll click the Next button on the Welcome screen. I'll select a choice to install the hardware that I manually select. I'll click Next. On the Common Hardware Types, I'll select that I'm trying to install a network adapter. I'll click Next and it'll present me with a list of included network adapters organized by manufacturer. So I'll select Microsoft as the manufacturer and then as I scroll down the network adapter list we'll see the loopback adapter listed. So Microsoft KM-Test loopback adapter. So I'll select that, click Next and it'll go through the process of when I click Next here, installing and finish that new network adapter. So we'll see here that I've uh, previously installed several different loopback adapters. So right now I've got one, two, three, four different uh, software-based loopback adapters that look like and act like real network interface cards for testing and lab purposes. Once you install a couple of these loopback adapters then, we're done in computer management for the time, so I'll go ahead and close that window. To configure NIC teaming, I'll click on my local server selection in my left navigation pane in the server manager tool and you'll see NIC teaming listed here along with each of the network adapters that are currently unteamed. So right now it shows that NIC teaming is enabled for me but in your case it probably is going to show disabled. That's the default value. If you click on that link it'll drop you into the graphical tool that's used for configuring NIC teams. 
This is the Load Balancing and Failover Admin Tool, or LBFO Admin. In order to create a new NIC team, all you have to do is select a couple of the adapters that will be added to the team. I'm just going to right click, select Add to New Team, give my team a name, call it Team 2, and then before I click OK, I'll expand out additional properties and I'll see that I can also select these additional properties to specify how the teaming should appear. So teaming mode allows me to select if I'm using a switch independent teaming mode where I don't need any switch configuration or if I want to use a switch dependent teaming mode that's either based on the LACP protocol now known as 802.1ax uh, or if I want to use a static teaming configuration. So these choices are going to be based on how what types of network switches you have in your environment and, and how those switches are configured for NIC teaming or not configured for NIC teaming. You can also, if you're using NIC teaming to balance traffic across the physical NICs, you can also determine your load balancing mode, hashing based either on address, uh, MAC address or IP address or whatnot, or uh, on Hyper-V port. And if you're using your NIC team strictly for just failover, you can also select that one of the adapters would be running in a standby only configuration. And that adapter would be used only in the event of the failure of the primary adapter that's active. If you have VLANing set up in your environment, you can also use NIC teams to split out multiple VLANs that might be coming through a switch trunk port into the server by associating specific VLANs with specific uh, NIC team interfaces. In my case, I'll just use the default VLAN choice and click OK. And now I've got my new team up and running. So you'll get a chance to configure NIC teaming both using the graphical LBFO admin tool, as well as in PowerShell, using a set of PowerShell commandlets that are specific for NIC teaming. So you'll get a chance to do both. After NIC teaming, then in week three, you'll be getting into configuring local storage. If I go ahead and switch over to my local storage study plan, and as you come in here, you'll see that a lot of the time that's spent around configuring local storage in the exam targets storage spaces, designing storage spaces, configuring storage pools and disk pools, deploying and managing storage spaces with PowerShell, thin provisioning, trim provisioning, all of that relates to the storage spaces capabilities. So storage spaces is a brand new feature set in Windows Server 2012 that provides the ability to introduce SAN-like capabilities for disk subsystems using just commodity disk hardware with Windows Server 2012. And so if you're operating in a small or mid-market environment, this is really exciting because it allows you to take advantage of your features that uh, perhaps were out of reach because they were tied to very expensive dedicated storage equipment. Um, now a lot of those features like thin provisioning and trim provisioning and being able to add additional disks into your server and dynamically grow the size of your disk pools uh, very easily over time, those features are now available to you using just commodity hardware. And so we've got the same approach, a video to introduce the topic, more detailed structured study materials, and then a lab on configuring storage spaces. Now, in the lab, in order to configure a storage space, you'll need to have multiple physical hard disks. But to prevent you from having to add a whole bunch of extra hardware into your study lab and plug in additional hard disks, we're instead going, going to go through the process in the lab of first adding a set of virtual hard disks. So these virtual hard disks uh, will add in using the computer management tool. So I'll drop back over to server manager on my tools menu, click on computer management, same place we were before when we were accessing device manager. Now we're going to go into computer management and select disk management. And under the disk management node, on the Actions menu, we'll see a choice called Create VHD. So Create VHD allows me to specify the path to a uh, file 
that I'm going to use as a virtual hard disk, either in VHD or the new VHDX format. So I'm just going to put in a file name path. I'll specify a size, so I'll make this 500 gig in size, and I will select the new format. VHDX. VHDX is the new format introduced for virtual hard disks with Windows Server 2012. It supports higher capacity, up to 64 terabyte virtual hard disks. It supports faster performance, even if you're using dynamically expanding virtual hard disks. And it provides additional resiliency through additional uh, disk structure logging that's done in the virtual hard disk VHDX format so that even if you have power unexpected power cycles of a server or whatnot the, um, the, the, the reliability of that virtual hard disk is protected. So I'm going to select my file name 500 gig virtual hard disk using VHDX format make it dynamically expanding click OK. Oop, I think I've already used that file once so let me go back in here and just specify a unique file name. And the same parameters. And we'll see that uh, once it creates that virtual hard disk, it allocates that as an additional virtual hard disk and automatically attaches it for use. Once you've done this a few times, created three or four virtual hard disks, you'll have enough virtual disks that you can start playing around with in uh, Server Manager to create your storage spaces. Now, um, one thing that you'll notice is when I created my new virtual hard disk, it automatically not only created it, but it attached it as an additional disk for me to use immediately. That's great, but that attachment does not persist reboots. So if you reboot your, like your study lab server and you want to play around with the virtual disks that you previously created, you'll, you'll need to go back in and reattach them in order to use them again. You can attach pre-existing virtual hard disks using the action menu and then specifying the attach VHD uh, selection. Once we have our virtual hard disks created, we can go ahead and close out of Disk Manager, and then we're ready to create our storage spaces, which is done over under File and Storage Services in Server Manager. So I'll select that on my left navigation area. And then on that menu, I'm going to select Storage Pools. Now you'll see I've got two different servers that are added into my Server Manager console, so I'll want to make sure that I'm looking at the correct disks on the correct server. It's really important when you start managing multiple servers from a single console to make sure you're clicking in the right spot. But uh, you'll notice that if I select my local server, I've got a number of different disks that are available for use as a storage pool. So in order to use those disks, I'll just right click on one of them, select New Storage Pool, I'll, at my new storage pool wizard screen, I'll click Next. I'll give a name to my new storage pool. And then I'll select one or more disks to add into that storage pool. Now as I select those disks, I have the ability to select all or just a few of the disks. And then on my allocation menu, I can specify whether I want those disks to be used automatically for data storage as I create new LUNs and volumes on that storage pool, or if I want any of those disks to be used as hot spares in the event of a failure of one of the physical disks that's associated with the storage pool. So I'll just select all of my disks. I'll click Next. And it's going to combine those together and give me a uh, approximately a two terabyte storage pool. So there we go. There's my new storage pool. Now that I've got my storage pool, now that I've got those disks kind of aggregated as a logical pool of disk space that I can carve out into uh, multiple LUNs, I can create a LUN on that storage pool by selecting the new virtual disk choice on the right-click menu from that storage pool. So that'll bring up the new virtual disk wizard. I'll click on Next, select my storage pool that I wish to provision a LUN from. 
I will type in the name for my LUN. I'll specify a disk layout, whether I want to just use simple striping with no resiliency or mirrored or parity configurations. I can also specify a provisioning type. So here's where I would select if I want to use thin provisioning and have only as much disk space used out of the storage pool as is required for storing data in volumes that are associated with this LUN. Um, that also allows me to over provision disk space. In other words, I could create a LUN that has more disk associated with it than actually exists in the storage pool. And that's a really powerful feature because it allows me to start off my physical disk investment pretty small in capacity and pretty inexpensive and get all of my LUNs and volumes defined at whatever size they ultimately are going to need to grow to based on my capacity calculations. As I start running low on real physical disk space, the server will notify me with some alerts. I just need to add additional physical disks in, allocate them to my storage pool, and automatically I'll be able to extend that virtual disk to incorporate those additional physical disks. So I'm going to select thin provisioning, and notice I'm going to over provision this. I've only got 1.95 terabytes of free space in my pool, but I'm going to say that I want to thin provision this new LUN as 3 terabytes of disk space. I'll go ahead and click Next, create that. It'll go through the process of creating my new LUN, or virtual disk as it's called in uh, Server Manager. And then it'll initialize the disk and update the cache that Server Manager uses to display that that new virtual disk is now created, thin provision, 3 terabytes in capacity. Because I don't have any volumes yet on this new LUN or this new virtual disk, it automatically launches the new volume wizard for me next. And I can use that to step through the process of selecting my LUN, clicking Next, selecting how much disk space from that LUN I wish to allocate to a particular formatted volume, specifying a drive letter or a folder mount path for the new volume, and then a file system type. Now NTFS is going to be the default file system type, however with Windows Server 2012 there is a new file system type called REFS, or REFS, stands for Resilient File System, and it's a file system type that's been introduced in Windows Server 2012 for very large data volumes on uh, say clustered file servers or whatnot. And the idea behind the resilient file system is to provide additional resiliency in the file system structure and in the metadata that makes up the file system so that it never has to be taken offline and it becomes self-repairing. So with the resilient file system, having to do things like take the volume offline or uncheck disk and whatnot has really been addressed with the resilient file system. Now, there are some limitations. Our EFS is not supported for OS or boot partitions. It's really intended right now for the use case of a data volume on a high capacity file server or file server cluster. So um, that's where REFS would fit today. I'm going to select NTFS as my file system format. I'll put a volume label on. I'll click Next and Create, and it'll create the new volume for me. So it's just that easy. Now, it will take a little while for it to format that volume. So I'm just going to, while it's doing that, I'm just going to switch back over and talk about our last study plan associated with the install request, which is based around installing and administering Active Directory. So I'll go ahead and sign into that study plan. And as that comes up, we'll see um, that a video is provided that provides us uh, what's new in deploying Active Directory, talks about the simplified deployment model with Active Directory, and, and then also some structured study materials that provide more detail on the simplified deployment options for building a new Active Directory forest, a domain within a forest, a domain controller within a domain, as well as demoting and upgrading domain controllers. We also have some information on virtualizing domain controllers. Windows Server 2012 for the first time has what's called virtualization safe technology built into it for domain controllers. So you can read about that. It's technology that allows you to virtualize a domain controller without having to worry about someone snapshotting it and rolling that virtual machine that's running the domain controller back in time. It 
detects those types of operations and takes appropriate action to repair the local Active Directory database properly on that domain controller to protect the integrity of Active Directory. So it's pretty cool stuff. The, um, the other piece that's new with Active Directory, more on the admin side, is the updated Active Directory Administration Center. So you'll get a chance to play around with that new tool and see some of the updates there. And then uh, some updates to the offline domain join process where that now supports offline domain joins over the internet uh, leveraging direct access for corporate network connectivity. And then there's a lab associated with installing Active Directory and making your study lab machine into a domain controller in its own forest. So you can play around with some of these tools. Let's just pop back into our uh, study lab and see how things are going. Looks like our volume is still formatting. I'll go ahead and minimize that for the time being so that we can talk about adding Active Directory, uh, the process used for adding Active Directory to a server. So up in Server Manager, Active Directory is added in like any other role now on a server. So we'll go to our Manage menu, select Add Roles and Features, and then step through the Add Roles and Features wizard, just like we did before, to select our server that we wish to install Active Directory on, and add Active Directory domain services as our role, and then next through the process of configuring uh, installing and configuring Active Directory on that machine. Now, w when you've installed Active Directory in the past, you've probably on prior versions of the server operating system, you've probably used other tools like AD Prep to prepare the schema, the forest, and the domain for adding a, a new version of Windows Server as a domain controller, and DC Promo to effectively build a new forest or domain or add a new replica domain controller to an existing domain in forest. Well, those tools have been somewhat deprecated. Now, the equivalent of AD Prep and DC Promo have all been rolled into the Add Roles and Features wizard. And what you'll find is that at the end of installing Active Directory, it'll offer to automatically launch a wizard that will do the equivalent of what AD Prep and DC Promo did in the past as part of a simplified Active Directory installation experience. Now, if you want to run AD Prep and DC Promo, those tools are still there, but they're changed a little bit. AD Prep is now really just a shell of a tool that when you run it calls the appropriate PowerShell scripts that do the schema, forest, or domain prep operations. And DC Promo, while it still exists, it only works when run in an unattended mode. DC Promo now exists solely for the purpose of being able to automate domain, Active Directory domain controller uh, promotion processes. If you were going through an automated process of building out domain controllers um, or perhaps uh, using the minimal server interface, for instance, to automate the process of bringing a, a new machine up and making it into a domain controller. So things have changed for the better in terms of the Active Directory uh, installation experience, so that's the good news. The other really good piece of news is the Active Directory Administration Center has been pretty significantly updated. If I go to my Tools menu in Server Manager, I can launch the Active Directory Administration Center. And when that tool launches, if I maximize my window here, down at the bottom you'll see this Windows PowerShell history area that I can expand out. And what this provides is a running log of any PowerShell commands that are being used to perform activities that I'm doing graphically through the Active Directory Administration Center. This is a great way of being able to learn the PowerShell commandlets that are used for interacting with Active Directory and then leveraging those commandlets to script out automated batch processes for adding new user accounts, disabling accounts, enabling accounts, moving users into an appropriate group and whatnot. In order to see that in action, I'm just going to drill through my organizational unit structure here. So I'll drop into my user's container. 
And then inside my users container on the action tasks menu, I will create a new user. And I'll give my new user a name, first name, and a last name. And a UPN login, which will also give the SAM account name, an initial password, and any other properties that I would wish to associate with this user account. And once I'm done, I can go ahead and click the OK button to create this new user. Now, it looked like from our perspective that stepping through that process, I just created a new user as one operation. But behind the scenes, what the Active Directory Administration Center does is runs a series, it runs a series of PowerShell commandlets with appropriate parameter values to perform what I've just requested through the graphical interface and then shows me those commands in the PowerShell history viewer. So I can see that the new AD user commandlet was run to initially create my user account with the base properties. Then the set AD account password commandlet was run to specify my initial password. The enable AD account commandlet was run to enable my account for logon. So on and so forth. So now that I know the PowerShell commands that are being used to perform perform that operation, I can select those PowerShell commands, I can copy them to my clipboard, I can paste them into my own scripts using the PowerShell integrated um, scripting environment editor and be able to prepare PowerShell scripts that automate this process on a batch scale. So some pretty cool stuff for being able to easily learn Active Directory. I um, encourage you to take a look at that um, Active Directory PowerShell History Viewer. You also may want to, while you're looking at the Active Directory Administrator, uh, Administrative Center, also come back to this, this, this top-level dashboard and on the Learn More tile, drill through these links to learn more about the new features of the Active Directory Administration Center. So I'd highly encourage you to do that as part of your installer quest to get more comfortable with the Active Directory Administration Center. So that's the process that we'll be going through over the next four weeks to study installing and configuring servers, server core, server with a GUI, and minimal server installation options configuring NIC teaming, configuring local storage, installing and administering Active Directory. So some pretty cool stuff. As you go through that process, remember to participate in our online peer study group community on LinkedIn. If you haven't currently joined yet, you can use the Join Us button on the Installer Quest page and be able to request to join that study group. Um, if you're in the U.S. Heartland area, you can also join on a monthly basis one of our participating user groups for a monthly jam session. And by all means, share your success as you complete the installer quest, use it as an opportunity to give yourself some kudos on your own social network, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or Facebook, if you use those social networks so that other people are aware of what you're doing and can take advantage of this program as well. To grow our study group community with additional IT pros that can bring with them their own added insights tips and, ba and, and background experience. Now once you've gone through the installer quest, the one thing that we ask is that you, cl you submit your claim for your early expert installer certificate. In order to process that certificate request, we do need to have some verification that you've completed each of the labs in the installer quest. And so because your lab machines are your own machines that you're using locally, um, we need to get a bit of information so that we can confirm that. So what we ask in step seven here is that when you're claiming your installer certificate, you provide us with a file attachment that's an export of your study lab servers configuration so that we can validate that yes, you've completed the labs and are entitled to that completion certificate. The process for configuring or for for exporting that file is very easy. Back on your study lab server in server manager, go to the tools menu 
and you can create that export file by using the system information tool. I'm going to go ahead and click on that system information tool. That will launch the system information window. Once that launches from the file menu, you can export a text file with your study lab server configuration and that's the file then that you would email as an attachment to the linked email address that's on the installer quest site right here so you can just click on this early exports link that'll pop open your email client you can attach that exported file shoot it over to us we'll review it confirm yes you've completed the labs and then within two to three business days get you your installer quest certificate of completion so that you can share that with everybody certainly through the process if you have questions feel free to post those questions in our LinkedIn study community um, in addition to myself we have several other community members that are monitoring that helping to respond to questions helping to provide a really valuable insight that we're all using to grow our knowledge base on Windows Server 2012 and by the time that you get done with your installer quest our goal is to have the next Quest Ready, the Explorer Quest, which is coming the week of October 15th, so that you can continue your study and prep for the Windows Server 2012 exams. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, the time and energy that you've been putting into this program. I hope it's been a valuable program for you. If you have any suggestions for improving it, I'm always open to any suggestions that you may have to increase the value of the program. Remember to tell everyone they can go out to earlyexperts.net to begin their own quest on preparing for the Windows Server 2012 certification exams. Thanks very much for listening to today's webcast. I appreciate your time and look forward to our continued work together as we all prepare for the Windows Server 2012 certification exams. Thanks everybody.